Thank you for the invitation for the introduction. Um, it's uh, I think it's perfect that I come after Everton and um, Italo, um, because I'm going to try and introduce a bit more of these fungi, some of their biology, focused on what we're doing, but um, it's worth bearing in mind a lot of other people are doing similar things um, to some of the things I'm going to show. Um, so, um, hang on, where am I? There we go. Um, so here's our logo for the INCT that has been mentioned. Um, and this is on bioinputs, innovative bioinputs. Um, I am based at the Federal University of Isosa. Um, Joanna, Joanna, yes, said that she did her master's there, I think, yesterday. She showed a picture. Um, and so this is between Rio and Belo Horizonte. It's kind of five hours from, from anywhere else. Interesting. Um, and Italy's going there next week. We have a symposium on entomology. Um, here's another. You may have seen some of these in Italy's presentations. So um, Ophiocordyceps attacking an ant. We have this in our these graveyards of these things in our forests nearby. Um, here's an image of our university that Joanna showed yesterday as well. Um, and my laboratory, we, we work on insect microbe interactions, as Patricia said. Um, we have an entomology program as well, postgraduate program, about 110, 12, sorry, 110, 20 postgraduate students. Um, it's just a bit closer. So um, Patricia is sort of over here somewhere near to Rio. Um, Italo is, where is Italo? Wow, I don't know where Piracicaba is properly. It's sort of here-ish somewhere. Everton is up here somewhere, and I'm here. Um, this is the university. You saw this picture yesterday. Um, and this is me. Um, you saw, I, I, I need to do a nice scheme of me flying from one place to another, I've realized. But I, I'm from... Um, Patricia said some of this, but um, I did do a master's in crop protection. Uh, my PhD was, this was the classical biological control, cassava green mite, and this is when I went to Brazil. Met it a little years ago, um, based at Imperial College. I'm in, Lon I'm in London at the moment, at UCL, um, on a sabbatical. But this was at Imperial in London. Um, I was in Amsterdam for three years. Um, I saw that uh, Fotheny was in Amsterdam as well with Astrid. I met Astrid before she moved to Amsterdam when I was doing my PhD. Um, went back to Imperial. This is when I was working with locusts. Um, then I started working as a lecturer and eventually moved to Brazil. Um, based on some of what we were talking about yesterday is, is um, relate, relevant to this. This is where... I know something about internationalization and so on because of our efforts while I was coordinator of our postgraduate program. Um, but that's just a quick introduction to me. Now let's meet the hypocreales. So you've seen some of these already, whether you knew it or not. Um, although I think Everton did say a bit more about this. So he introduced the Ascomicota. Um and anyone who wants to get an introduction to them, I'm going to suggest this paper from 2009. Um, the number of people who work on these uh, pathogens. And this is a review. And I'll show you some bits of this review. Um, I'm here just to, just to situate where these fungi are. Ascomicota, Ascomicota here. It's worth mentioning Entomophthorales as well, which is a specialized group that it's it's Entomophthoraceae. This, this is sort of a bit out of date, but it's nicely colored, so I like it. Um, um, these are highly specialized uh, pathogens of insects, also mites. So my PhD was on one of these, um, on mites and cassava, and that's what Italy was working at, on at the same time. And that was the classical bio biological control. But our focus today is the here. And this is a really nice scheme because this shows some of the groups of uh, hyper, within the hypercreales, some of the families. Um, 
And the interesting thing here, and Italo mentioned some of this, is that it's believed that this group started as plant pa parasites, pathogens, um, and then there have been these host switches throughout the history of the group. And it's understood that these host switches are not um, so much losing genetic capabilities, but more switching things off and on. So where an organ, where a pathogen here, for example, I mean, this is very, this is pure supposition, but this is a plant, this, this infects plants and not a pathogen in this case, I'll come to that. They, it might, they might still have some capacity to infect animals, probably insects because of their evolutionary history here in red. Red and green is not great for a color scheme. Sorry if anyone's daltonic. Um, but you can, if you trace it to the end, you can see. Um, and so what this means is that a lot of these fungi may be able to affect fun other fungi, affect plants, and affect animals. May still have the capacity to do that. Um, and we'll come on to this a bit. So I'm going to go through some of these groups. Um, start with the Ophiocordycipitaceae, which used to be, this used to be Cordyceps, but then it got, um, a new genus was erected, and then, oh, there's a, oh no, a new genus, um, and then a whole family. So this is the zombie ant fungus. There's a TV program about this now. person who um, did a lot of this research, uh, uh, Harry Evans, who's at Cabby Bioscience, not far from here. He's a friend and we've done some work with him. So he came to Brazil. Well, I, when I came to Brazil in 2006, he was actually already in Brazil. Um, and we did some work on on this. This is in ants. Um, and it's well, it's interesting to note that there are members of the group that can parasitize other fungi. Um, this is one attacking wasp, a wasp. This is something we're looking at now. Um, there's some something known about this, but there are some sort of subtle differences like this one will bite the side of a leaf. So the manipulation by the fung by the fungus is a bit different. It also grows out two sides. I came up with an, ex an explanation for this, but I can't remember. Different from the ants where it comes out just behind the pronotum. This is also Ophiocordyceps. Um, then I'll come back to, I'm coming back to all of these. Then we have the Clavicipitaceae, and here we have this wonderful fungus with my favorite scientific name. Epichloe, um, or in the Anamorph Neotiphodium. Um, and this is a this is the best known fungal endophyte. This is the one that infects grasses um, and cause st causes staggering in cattle. So this poisons cattle. And this is how endophytic fungi were discovered um, when people realized that it was toxins being produced by the fungi in the plant. That were causing this effect on the cows. Um, that's here, Epichloe. Uh, Claviceps is a well known plant pathogen, path plant pathogenic fungus. Um, then we also get Metarhizium here. Now, this is Metarhizium acridum um, in a locust, desert locust. Um, and I'll talk a bit about this later. Um, then we get the Cordycipitaceae. We have Bovaria that Everton mentioned. This is one that we just found. Uh, leaf cutter. Well, I'll say queen, but she didn't get to be a queen. Um, she did lose her wings, but she didn't get to be a queen because she died because of Bovaria. It's common to see insects infected walking along the soil. You'll see a caterpillar that are trying to pupate to make it infected with Bovar Bovaria on the soil. Um, and we also have Cordyceps here. Then we have this group here, Trichoderma that um, Italo mentioned, including the product Trichoderma de Mil, or I can't remember the name. Um, this is widely used for biological control, um, often endophytic, and it will uh, help you control plant diseases, fungal plant diseases, because it's mycoparasitic. And related to it is Escovopsis. Um, some of you may know this fungus. This is well known for attacking leafcutter ant colonies so you could say it's a bad fungus that attacks the good fungus that the ants cultivate um so it's a parasite of fungus gardens um, i'll show you something on this as well um 
and I'm not mentioning this group, but Fusarium is um, a major plant pathogen here. Um, just worth pointing this one out. Um, okay, so a bit more on Ophiocordyceps. Uh, this really should be, this image should really be upside down because they're usually on the underside of the leaf. You can see the central vein here. Um, and this is work we did um, when Harry arrived and then David Hughes, who took this who took this up uh, working at Penn State. So we identified new species because until then there was only one species known. And we found, what, four new species from a few fragments of forest near us. And this is Atlantic forest, um, which I'll come back to. Um, and there's an interesting example of uh, convergent evolution here with Entomophthorales, which have very similar structures for infecting insects or mites, these Capiloconidia. Um, and this has its anamorphic form, which is Hercetella, which was also on um, one of Italy's graphs uh, as a biocontrol product used in mites. Um, some, you get some old drawings. There are some wonderful old drawings of these things. Um, and this these these fungi of course contributed to the idea that um plants can become an uh, sorry animals can become plants this old age idea of uh, i can't remember trans trans something um when fungi were considered plants uh so you have these wonderful fungi coming out of caterpillars um and in, and these are used in especially in china for traditional medicine um it's the same group as um uh the, the the fungus that produces lsd so it produces lots of alkaloids so there's lots of interesting chemicals being produced in here um of potential medical importance this is just to show some of the diversity so the, each one is a different species that we identified and in this case each one is in a different species of Camponotus ants carpenter ants um we did some more work on this. So this is Raquel was a student, um, did a lot of this work. This was the first long-term monitoring of a disease of a social insect colony, I think, in or in the field. Um, we did this in our forest uh, in five, four or five plots. Uh, if you look at the paper, you'll see these things rotating through time along the trails. You see where the cadavers are. Um, just to point out that there's interesting biology there um metarhizium then we're going to take let's talk a little bit about metarhizium this is work i did a long time ago um when i was at, on my postdoc at imperial um controlling locusts um and in this case i did some lab work with desert locust um on behavioral fever um some consequences of this phenotypic consequences in the locusts, the locusts, of course, have wonderful um, biology. They the phenotype. They have the different phenotypes that are really important. But I want to point out here that we also did field trials in Africa, um, in these flooded wetlands. That's where we were camping there, where we got flooded out um, against the red locust. Now, this this um, fungus is now being used against um, locusts in Central and Southern Africa. Um, and it's something that Italo touched on, which is this business of um, spending your money to bring in products from abroad, chemical products from abroad, from Japan, Switzerland, and so on. In this case, there's the potential to produce this fungus in um, in Africa, in this case, South Africa, for use in Africa. It's being used in Australia as well. Not so much in Brazil, because where the locusts breed, the cerrado, the savanna is... Um, a lot of it being turned into soybean. Um, so there aren't really isn't such a problem with locusts, although there have been outbreaks recently. Um, this was a, a wonderful project that had a large French involvement um, called Lubilosa. Um, Everton mentioned formulation. The formulation of this fungus was wonderful because it's you can be used in the desert. Um, and we went to FAO in Rome and persuaded them to adopt this, to promote it. So they kind of took it on as if it was something they had developed 
which is great because then FAO in their in their bull bulletins they have these wonderful anti locust bulletins, and they'll um, promote this and and talk about using this fungus. Um, this, um, but this is this still remains a bit niche compared with what Italy was showing. So it's I'll come back to that, but it's very gratifying now to see that this is increasing um, in use. Um, this is another aspect. Um, this is some work we did on, and we're sort of picking this up again, um, looking at soils. So these fungi you find in the soil, some people at some point used to call them um, soil fungi, soil saprophytes, but really they have long been considered entomopathogenic fungi, fungi like metarhizium. Um, and here what we did was we just took bits of, took some soil, um, put uh, tenebio larvae, larvae, beetle larvae in, just as a, a, a lab animal we could use, and found, monitored their survival and also their infection, in this case, probably by Bovaria, but a large amount of this was metarhizium. And what we found was that in soils that had been um, heavily exposed to the sun, so where there was intensive weeding, um, which is this full sunline, uh, sunline, sorry, this full sunline here, no, sorry, this full sunline up here, the um, larvae could survive much longer than in the um, agroforestry soils where there's ground cover and shade. So the idea here is that this um, protecting the soil can protect what we consider we're trying to um, get people to understand as an ecosystem service of these fungi in the soil. Um, this is three areas with the same result of coffee because we have a lot of coffee production where we are. Um, this is something we're still trying to, to, to get written up, but the person who... Um, who did this work has fortunately is fortunately now being now employed at Copper. She worked with Italo for a bit, so it's about a bit difficult to, for us to finish the paper because she's got so much to do. Um, but something that we find, and it's not just us who find this. Italo, I think, has a paper showing something similar, and then people in Canada and in Denmark or Norway, I can't remember. Um, show that the different species of metarhizium can actually um be associated with different types of plant um and what this starts to indicate is that maybe the plants are more important for these fungi in the soil than any insects um and this is sort of an emerging pattern with metarhizium at least that it seems they're more um they're more uh plant associates than insect pathogens in a way um, this comes back to a paper I wrote when I was in Amsterdam back in 2000 with this idea that maybe plants can use entomopathogens as bodyguards. Um, some of the ways in which we imagine this happening don't really seem to happen, but some others do, especially endophytic um, associations. Um, here's a paper from, what is it, 2019 from people at Royal Holloway here and, and, and also elsewhere. Yeah, elsewhere as well. Um, this is So this is a meta analysis a review a systematic review um showing when you put uh these entomopathogenic fungi onto the plants as soil drench or something um then they can have these negative effects on herbivores um now some of that may be a lot of that may be by stimulating plant defenses like it said um uh but this is very good paper to, to to get an idea of this unfortunately they call trichoderma an insect pathogen which is a bit odd um, but this does lead us into this um, idea of these uh, entomopathogens being usable as fungal endophytes um, it was done some work on this some other people have as well um, here's something that I co-supervised the student with our, my colleague Madeleine Venzong who's at EPAMIG which is a a state research agency from so the state of Minas Gerais um and here what we what we did was um apply metarhizium to coffee seedling roots as a soil drench um it does form an association although that's transient it doesn't last forever and it has effects in this case on leaf miners um 
So it reduces the number of mines um, per, per seedling um, and eventually the number of adults, depending on which fungus you use, uh, has effects on survival. Yeah, so the leaf area mind here. Um, and we also find that it can act as, they can act as growth, growth promoters, um, which may even be more important. Why they act as growth promoters, I couldn't tell you. Um, but this is this is a, an area that's opening up. Um, people are wanting to apply these fungi to, to as growth promoters. So like Italo was saying, the growers want to use this, these products, um, these fungi. Now, um, Bavaria has long been, like Everton said, one of the main uh, fungi of interest for biological, for microbial control. Um, I'm not going to show much on this, but I'll actually show a bit more on cordyceps that um, Italo also mentioned. Um, this is, there are now products being used, and as growers are using a lot of this, they're using it for um, dalbulus, which is the uh, big problem in maize. Um, they're using this. Um, and this is just showing showing that it can be endophytic as well. Um, so people in Barapa are working on this as well. Um, and so you can maybe get this into the plant. Maybe it'll grow out into leaf mines or something. Um, that's all I'm going to show because we've got a paper that's submitted. But um, there's more on this. So watch this space because there's something quite potentially quite big with this. Um, but I won't. It's not my work directly, so I don't want to um, to say too much about that. And then onto the these ones, which are largely mycoparasitic. So trichoderma, I've mentioned, but also Escovopsis. Um, this is showing a uh, fungus garden of a leaf cutter ant. This is in the lab. Um, and this is Escovopsis um, with potentially phoretic spores here, which is all quite interesting. And again, with um, Harry Evans with us. Oops, cut his name out. With Harry, Harry with us, we um, identified a number of new species from and a new genus from the from our little fragments of Atlantic forest. Um, they have very can have quite different morphologies. Um, people at Unespi in São Paulo are, are doing great things um, with uh, the taxonomy of these um, fungi. Lots on the biology, and there's probably quite a lot coming out in the near future on this group. Um, and ooh, I can't quite remember why I wanted to show this slide. I've forgotten now. But this is the Escovopsis group. Um, I think I wanted to show that it's similar, close to, um, I can't remember. Uh, I think this may, there may be some uh, endophytes in here with the possibility that this fungus could be endophytic. But I've completely gone blank on this. So I'll move on. Anyway. Um, we've done some work on this, showing that these these fungi are cited in textbooks and sort of semi-popular science books. This fungus is called this highly virulent thing that can devastate ant colonies. Um, we've shown that this is not true, that if you spray this fungus as much as you can on a colony, then if it provided the queen is there, uh, the colony can survive. Um, this is more into sort of pure biology, really. Although there may be potential application here, although in theory these fungi don't really damage the colony, they the colony seem to tolerate them. There is this idea that if you um, say you spray an insecticide to suppress the ants' um, defenses, then these fungi might come start to take over the colony. That's a possibility. Um, this is some work we did also a while ago when Harry was there. Um, and we're hopefully going to pick this up again. And this is um, looking at foraging of leafcutter ants. So they get these fragments and they take it to their nest. Um, but then they also will reject fragments. So they'll leave them for a bit. Um, and we think this may, this the, this period when they leave these leaves to dry out, the fungus starts to grow out like it does in a, in a Petri dish. Um, we think at that point, the ants can detect what endophytic fungi are in these leaf fragments. The reason we think they can do that is that when we look at the different fungi we find in the leaf fragments, um, we find that uh, proportionally some fungi 
are subsequently removed more than others. So this one, um, whereas Colototricum, which um, doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be any problem the ants have with this because they carry it, they don't seem to reject it. But then Cylindrocladium, Dresslera, Epicoccum, and then interestingly Trichoderma. Although we find very small amounts endophytic in our leaf fragments we find it mostly in the material that's rejected much more than in what's being carried in the first place. Um, so it's disproportionately rejected. So we think the ants are able to, um, to determine, to recognize these. And um, we proposed in this paper that you could maybe uh, use this to protect plants um, and prevent the ants or the ants might learn to avoid those plants because they could potentially be damaging to the colony this is so this is showing similar result but with a different um leaf cutter species so we found the result in um two species this is a second paper where we focused on trichoderma but with a second ant species um and showing that there are zones of inhibition with the good fungus that the ants cultivate um and potential to uh, damage the uh, fungus garden in this case it was queenless colonies um which is always a bit suspect but there is this possibility, this um, group up in Tocantins in Brazil, uh, investing more in this line of research. Um, I've got a student starting to work on this again. And this is just to show, you find these um, fungi all over the place. So in this case, this is Trichoderma. Um, and we find it in um, termite colonies. Why? We're not entirely sure. Um, we thought it, the ants, the termites might be using it to protect themselves against pathogens and so on. We find it in 10% of workers here and uh, in their bodies and also in 60% of fragments within in this. So this is fragments of the termite mound. So it's quite abundant. So we're, we're not sure if it has any role, but if anything, we only found negative effects. Um, so just to show that these things interact in with insects in all sorts of ways that you may not imagine, um, because trichoderma, a uh, mycoparasitic fungus, why would it interact with, why would it be abundant in termite colonies? We don't know, we just found it. And so we investigated more. Um, so where are we now? So I'll just give a, a few ideas of um, some things that we're working on and that might be interesting for, for the future. Um, this is a paper we wrote back in 2011 where we suggested um, that we we're only touching tipping, touching the tip of the iceberg with some of this diversity of fungi in these forests. Um, at the time, there were 1.5 million species of fungus, fungi, or that, that was the estimate of the number. I think it's gone up to about 4 million now. And um, those mostly considered free living or conspicuous fungi. But these fungi that if you look, you'll find especially parasitic fungi, unculturable fungi. Um, there is this huge diversity. Um, and one reason I think that's important is that we do have areas like the Atlantic forest. This is the original extent of the Atlantic forest in Brazil um, compared to the current extent. Um, so where Patricia lives down here, she has, probably has lots of it. Where we live, we have some fragments. Um, and this is one of the most threatened biomes in on the planet and is a, a biodiversity hotspot. Um, here's a fragment um, in close to a Espiritu Santo state. You can see if you, I don't know if you can see, but behind you can see, um, even though this is a park, a nature reserve, behind you'll see areas that, have, that are turned over to pasture, coffee, eucalyptus. Um, so it is very fragmented. So I think these, these, um, fungi in these forests could potentially be important for us to to highlight the diversity in these in these forests. Um, this is just a close up of the one from the wasps, uh, something we're working on. Another one from wasps, and people send us these specimens. Um, the ecological role of these fungi in the forests as well, or uh, forests, but also agroecosystems. There's a lot we don't know. Um, I've submitted a proposal recently to try and see if these endophytic fungi may be um, affecting via ant foraging in forests, um, plant communities. 
So it's something that be I'm hoping to work on. Uh, it's probably quite ambitious, but if we get funding, we'll have to be looking at this. Um, there's a lot of the biology that we don't know. Um, here's uh, a couple of things. We're working on one thing, which is using these two fungi as a model to look at co-infections. Um, interactions with plants is an awful lot we don't know. So we know that they can protect plants from biotic and abiotic stress. A uh, key thing here is uh, humidity, drought. Um, that may be in very important, especially with people using transgenic plants to try and get drought tolerance. Perhaps these fungi will be a potential uh, way to, to to attack that. It's just to show some of our co-infection work with uh, to these two strains. We're doing this because they're different colors, which helps. Um, and then to the perhaps the main point here is biological control, um, including conservation, biocontrol, ecosystem services that Italo mentioned. Um, so things like metabolism as a plant growth promoter, um, cordyceps here, into a pathogenic fungi to protect on drought. There's loads of potential. Um, I like this slide of Italo's, so I borrowed it. Um, and you could pick any number of slides from Italo's presentation, but this part here is quite um important i think to show how much is going on in brazil and so that's just uh, some things i want to point out um i put a little chinese flag here to remind myself that in china they do a lot of work getting these fungi and um for drugs potential drugs there are companies in in brazil now starting to look at this and uh, maybe bringing some of the people from china uh, a uk guy um to look at this uh, so those are some of the things that I think are important for the future. Um, just to point out some of the funding organizations here, of course, loads of students. I don't actually have a decent picture with um, everyone, um, but that's it. I've gone three minutes over, I think. Sorry about that. But there we are.